little bit earlier about the aid agencies and how they were operating in the Philippines. Well, whenever humanitarian agencies are working in volatile or fragile countries like the Philippines, the one problem they're often faced with is how to ensure aid gets to those in need and doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Well, a report today published by two think tanks says some aid agencies in Somalia paid al-Shabaab militants in order to gain access to areas under their control in the famine two years ago. So what are the moral and practical challenges that face aid agencies on the ground? Uh, with me uh, in a moment, I'll be debating this issue with Sitara Jabin from the International Committee of the Red Cross, a charity that had to suspend food distribution in al-Shabaab controlled territory for a time, and Noor Sheikh, who's an expert on the Horn of Africa from the Rift Valley Institute. But first, uh, to try and explain what came out in the report, I I'm joined by Mary Harper, who's Africa editor at the BBC World Service. Mary, uh, thank you for coming in. And uh, just to what extent do we think that this has been going on, aid agencies actually having to hand cash to militants like al-Shabaab? This uh, report that has revealed the most extraordinary detail about the way the aid agencies that worked in al-Shabaab territories during the devastating famine of 2011, the compromises they had to make, for example, they had to pay registration fees of up to $10,000 and then they had to keep paying taxes to al-Shabaab. They had to sign special pledges saying that they'd behave in a certain way. They wouldn't break religious or social rules imposed by al-Shabaab. They weren't allowed to employ women. Al-Shabaab took control of directly handing out the food and in fact diverting or stealing about half of it in some towns. So, How, how specific has it been about how many agencies have been involved and who they were? Uh, it hasn't named any of the agencies who are involved because for their own security uh, they would be banned by al-Shabaab I'm sure if they actually were named in this report so they have remained right. nameless but we know that for example pretty much all the United Nations agencies and many other of the well-known ones were forbidden from working in al-Shabaab territory but there are a number of uh, British and Western agencies that did carry on working as well as lots of Muslim ones. Now I'm sure a lot of people who give money to charities working in places like Somalia would be horrified to hear that money was handed over, initially uh, horrified to hear that, but when you actually think of what the alternative is, perhaps that does raise questions about being pragmatic and thinking if we don't pay al-Shabaab we might not treat these people who will otherwise die. Exactly, and that is the dilemma that these aid agencies face. They're, whatever they do is going to be wrong in the eyes of some people. And in Somalia, in that famine, which was the first famine of the 21st century, most of the people who were affected were in al-Shabaab territory. More than a quarter of a million of the people there died, half of them children. So what is an aid, aid agency supposed to do? Are they supposed to abandon those people or are they supposed to pay al-Shabaab in the same way that they pay almost any other armed group that controls other parts of Somalia? So it's a terrible choice facing anybody operating in this. I mean, do we actually carry out the task that we've been in, trying to do or end up handing money to people who we really don't find very savoury at all? Yeah, it's a really difficult moral dilemma. And also they face the added problem that some countries, such as the United States in particular, makes it a criminal act to either communicate with or distribute food in territories that they say are controlled by the people they label as being terrorists. So these aid agencies were also treading a very fine legal line as well. Let's uh, talk to Sitara Jabin from the International Committee of the Red Cross. And Sitara, I mean, what is your organization's policy on handing money to Al Shabaab? W what have you done? Well, um, our policy is very clear and it applies to all those countries in the world wherever we are working. The policy says that we have to work strictly neutrally and impartially. That means that we have to concentrate completely our resources and our efforts for reaching all the victims on all sides um, in the conflict. And we had the same policy in Somalia at the time uh, as mentioned in this report. Does that effectively mean that you are having not to treat people, to help people who are in need, if you are steadfastly not giving money to get access to places where you can't go? Well, 
at the time, uh, what we did is that we not only work um, ourselves as ICRC, but we always worked very closely with the local Red Cross or Red Crescent Society. So in Somalia, we were working very closely with the Somali Red Crescent Society. And even at the time, we were not able to carry out our activities. We were still able to continue our efforts through the Somali Red Crescent Society that was running clinics for the, for the wounded and sick people and also providing other services in Somalia. I'm just trying to be clear that although you were operating through more local agencies, did not handing money to Al-Shabaab mean that there were people that you just simply couldn't get to? But for us, um, what happened in uh, in this situation in in January 2012, we had to interrupt our food distributions in the south of Somalia, because uh, because we believed that our modalities we were not in agreement with the with the local um, uh, local authorities on the ground. So in that case, we had to interrupt our activities at the time, but we continued to work through the Somali Red Crescent Society that was providing uh, basic and very important life-saving services to the people. And for us, it is very important to maintain a direct contact with, uh, with all the agencies, um, all the sides involved into the crisis. So that's why we resumed our dialogue uh, with Al-Shabaab and all the others involved into the situation at the time. And we continue talking to them until uh, we were able to, to convince them of our working modalities and we were able to resume our activities. Noor Sheikh, uh, what, you're from the, the Rift Valley Institute. Um, is it possible for you to, to give a sense of how many people would, how many of these agencies would, would uh, comply with Al-Shabaab's demands in order to get access or others who would take a stance of, of looking at the long term perhaps uh, and uh, negotiating? I think, uh, um, as Mary um, said, this report is uh, very detailed. The researchers did a very good job. We don't know the agencies um, uh, that have actually been engaging with Al-Shabaab, but from uh, working in, in Somalia, I also know that uh, a lot of, um, most of these agencies working in southern, southern central Somalia, uh, and, uh, and, and by agencies, I mean international um, organizations, um, did actually engage with, with Shabab. And as has been said by the colleague from uh, the R Red Cross, uh, the, the objective is very clear, simple and clear, to save lives. There was no alternative. Um, uh, during the time of the famine, the uh, government was not in control of the capital city, Mogadishu itself. Forget about you know other parts of the country. So the only uh, a group that one can uh, walk through to, to, to gain access were the Shabab, and I think agencies were left with no uh, other option but to go through these uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, channels to reach the uh, needy and vulnerable populations. Mary, Noor was just outlining how complicated it is for all aid agencies, and uh, we were hearing from Sitara uh, uh, as well about the, what the Red Cross was doing. I mean, does this look like it will change? Is it, what, what is happening in terms of legislation, briefly? Yeah, it's interesting. In the US, draft legislation has been prepared which would allow uh, agencies to distribute food and also to communicate with organizations such as Al-Shabaab and others, uh, partly so that those people who would die otherwise uh, have a chance of surviving, and also so that some possible negotiations maybe to bring about peace uh, could also come about without those agencies being criminalised. Mary Harper, thank you very much. Also, thank you to Sitara Jabin in Geneva and Noor Sheikh in Nairobi. Yes.